Okay, hi everybody. Uh, thanks for joining me today for this webinar on Dutch history. I'm Bob Ottenhoff and I'm a member of the Washington DC chapter of the Netherland America Foundation. Among other things, our chapter holds an annual fundraising dinner each spring called the Ambassadors Awards Dinner in honor of previous American ambassadors to the Netherlands. And we host occasionally lectures such as this one on civic, cultural, and historical topics. Each year we fund scholarships for Dutch students to take academic internships in the DC area. If you'd like to learn more about the NAF or the Washington chapter, please go to our website, thenaf.org. In 1884, my great grandparents left their home in Groningen and endured the arduous journey to Chicago bringing along four young children. Of all the places in the world, why did they pick Chicago? I suspect a lot had to do with the fact that many other Groningers left their homes and had settled there. In the following decade, my maternal grandparents left their homes in Middleburg in the province of Zeeland and settled in Oostburg, Wisconsin. You guessed it, in a community nearly all Dutch. What motivated my ancestors to immigrate to the United States? And why did they settle where they did? How common was their story and their experiences among the thousands of Dutch that came to North America both before and after them? To learn more about Dutch immigration and its impact on the United States, we're pleased to have as our guest today, Dr. Robert Skronejongen. He's a professor emeritus at Calvin University where he taught history for many years. In his official biography, he writes that there are three historical themes he finds fascinating. Human migration patterns, the definitions people give themselves and place among others, and the manner in which events are interpreted both at the moment and after the fact. His work has concentrated on immigration to the United States through 1920, the American presidency and the impact of religion on everyday lives. In today's webinar, we'll take about 45 minutes to hear, about doc, to hear from Dr. Skona Youngen, and we'll leave about 15 minutes to answer your questions. If you have a question, please mm -hmm. use the Q&A box found at the bottom of the screen to direct your questions. We'll do our best to answer as many of your questions as possible. And now it's my pleasure, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Skuna Youngen. Good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see you, um, wherever you are. Um, I'm staring at a, lens, at a lens of a camera, and I'm used to doing these things in front of an audience, but um, I'll do the best I can. Um, I hope you enjoy what I have to say, and I hope what I had to say will resonate with you and um, stimulate your questions and also uh, inspire you to find out more about your own family, whatever ethnic background you may be. We'll begin with the year 1909 and a celebration in New York that was called the Hudson Fulton Celebration. It was a, it was a, a, an event that was put on to mark two anniversaries the 300th anniversary of the expedition of Henry Hudson into the river that bears his name, and the centennial plus two years of the sailing of Robert Fulton's book, or a steamboat, uh, the Claremont. Um, the event was a big fundraiser in many ways. There was all kinds of memorabilia you could buy. There were two weeks of celebrations and exhibits. There was a pageant that they put on. They dedicated monuments to um, Henry Hudson and to Robert Fulton uh, up and down the Hudson River. Um, there was a, a as, as this poster is, indicates, there was a, um, an exhibition put on by the United States Navy. Um, you could buy posters, you could buy pennants. Um, the interesting thing about this, when you look at the background, is there were a number of sponsors who promoted this, this, this uh, celebration. One of them was the Holland America Line. The second one was the Holland Society of New York, 
which had been founded in 1885 uh, with uh, um, membership limited to people who were descended from people who had lived in New Netherland as of 1675. The, the founder of the, the, as much as you can say one person does this, the founder of the Holland Society is the fellow on the left. His name is Robert Roosevelt. Robert Roosevelt has a rather famous nephew by the name of Theodore, who um, became president of the United States. And uh, Robert Roosevelt helps to start this society as a way of promoting uh, the, and, and, and the, the memory of what New Netherland was and the impact that the Dutch had had on the founding of the United States. The third major player behind this was the Reformed Church in America, which began with the organization of a congregation in New York in 1628, what evolved into what is now known as the Collegiate Church. Um, and for many years, the Reformed Church in America was the preserve where Dutch culture and the, the, the uh, memory of New Netherland resided uh, among its membership and also among its, its leadership. 1909 is at the high point of what one scholar, Annette Stott from the University of Denver, called Holland mania. All things Dutch for many reasons were um, um, a big deal culturally in the United States for roughly 30 to 40 years from around, around 1880 through about 1920. Um, two very famous brands which are still around kind of testify to this. Uh, the Dutch boy paint symbol, the Dutch boy as the, as the paint symbol comes from 1907 and old Dutch cleanser from 1905. So that the idea of Dutch has commercial appeal in the United States around 1909 at the time of the, of the, Fulton, of the Hudson Fulton celebration. Um, much of this is the result of the work of two writers. One is, uh, and, and these books all came out roughly between 1856 and 1866, the multi-volume history of the Netherlands written by John Lathrop Motley, who was an American uh, diplomat, uh, was fascinated by, by um, the history of the Dutch in, in, uh, in, in, in wrote, the wrote the story of how the, how the Netherlands comes to be as a separate country within Europe. The other is a novel that was standard fare for many, many years and has been made into movies and comic books and whatnot, called Hans Brinker or the Silver Skates. Um, Hans Brinker, among other things, gives rise to another image of Dutchness that became very common in the United States. And that's of the little boy sticking his finger in the dike to save the Netherlands uh, from, from destruction from the ocean. Um, people putting the Delft tiles into their houses, putting tulips into their gardens, um, naming an ice company in New York after Dietrich Knickerbocker um, are all symptoms of what, what's happening with this, this Dutch mania at the, at, in this period. And of course, all of this is harking back to the story of New Netherland. And um, in the United States, it's probably safe to say that the image of New Netherland became um, very closely tied to the image of one man, and that's Peter Stuyvesant, who was the last essentially governor uh, of, of the Dutch colony. And uh, there are high schools named after him in New York. There's a park named after him in New York. And uh, generations of Americans grew, grew up with the story of Peter Stuyvesant and his wooden leg. The truth of the matter was um, Stuyvesant was a rather heavy handed man. And uh, because of the way he ran the colony, um, many, of the, many of the inhabitants uh, were not at all un unhappy to see the English come and remove and, and relieve them from having to listen to Robert, to, to, uh, to, the, to Peter Stuyvesant. So that with Stuyvesant, you get this image of that these Dutch people that settled New Netherland were kind of stiff-headed people who didn't listen very well and um, 
a lot of a lot of the image of the Dutch is going to evolve out of that. The truth of the matter is that uh, New Netherland probably lo looms larger in the American story than it does in the Dutch story, because uh, New Netherland, as this map indicates, was only one piece of a much bigger puzzle that the Dutch traders coming out of Rotterdam and Amsterdam are are involved with um, for, for literally for, for centuries. Um, New Netherland lives on, or New Netherland's problem from the beginning was that it sat in between two major areas of British settlement. And uh, New Netherland is squeezed from, the, from New England and New Netherland is gonna be squeezed from the West, from the west through, uh, because of Pennsylvania. Um, the, the seat of New Netherland becomes the city of New Amsterdam. And here we have a map of approximately what it looked like in 1664, about the time that the, the, the English come and uh, take, over, take over the colony. And of course, we could go on with lots of stories about how New Netherland and New Amsterdam live on in place names, um, the Battery, the Bowery, Broadway, Canal Street, Wall Street, um, the borough of Brooklyn are all indicators of the, the Dutch heritage that, that did outlast the colony itself. The Dutchness resides, will last amazingly long. When you think about the, the people who lived in New Netherland, the, the people who had come to New Netherlands from Holland, from the Netherlands, and were Dutch speakers, very quickly became a minority. And uh, the, the use of the Dutch language, which was official until 1664, is wiped out by the, by the English and witnessed the, the, the changing of the name to New York to honor the king's brother. Where the Dutch, where the Dutch heritage will last is going to be um, in the homes and in the architectural style. So that scattered throughout the Hudson Valley and northeastern New Jersey, you will find houses that were built by Dutch settlers that look like this. Um, these are these two houses in northern New Jersey are about 10, 15 miles apart, and you can see there's a there, there's a the architecture of them is very very similar, made out of sandstone. The other place where Dutchness will reside is in the Reformed Church, which will re, which will call itself the Dutch Reformed Church, to use its short version, until 1867. And it was not at all uncommon, particularly in more rural areas, well into the 19th century, that you could go into a, into a Reformed Church in upstate New York or in, uh, in uh, northern New Jersey, and you could sit in a service that was being conducted in Dutch. There is great tension within the Reformed Church during the 19th century with how Dutch do they want to be. Um, the leaders are acutely aware, the ministers are acutely aware that the Reformed Church rests on the uh, membership and the contributions of the the descendants of New Netherland who had gotten land from the West India Company and have set themselves up almost as barons, if you will, um, in, in the countryside. The people who live in these sandstone houses are the people who are on the councils, the consistories as they would have called them, of these churches and, you'll, and are building these buildings uh, which are all dating from roughly 1750 to um, 1800. The leaders of the Reformed Church are trying to stamp out the use of the Dutch language in the churches. There is fierce resistance to this uh, among many. Even in the homes, Theodore Roosevelt, who was born in 1858, remembers his grandfather doing uh, devotions at, the, at dinner in Dutch, 
praying in Dutch. So we're looking in the second half of the 19th century in households, an archaic form of the Dutch language hung on. The other important thing to remember about the Reformed Church in New York especially, is that they, they, they saw themselves for good reason as being the social leaders and political leaders for that matter of the state of New York with the intermarriage between the Dutch landholders and their English equivalents, which produces, for instance, um, the person that on your $10 bill, Alexander Hamilton, whose wife is a Schuyler, whose father owns a nice big house um, up by Albany and a lot of land uh, in, the, in the Albany area. And actually throughout the, the uh, in, 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 down into New Jersey as well. Um, the symbol, and worth spending a minute, couple of minutes uh, uh, on alone, is Martin van Buren. Um, Martin van Buren grew up or was born an American citizen, the first president who actually was born a U.S. citizen, 1783, in Kinderhook, in uh, upstate New York, uh, about 20, 30 miles south of Albany. His father ran a tavern, and uh, Martin van Buren. Grew, grew up as a as a child speaking Dutch. Um, the business at his father's tavern was conducted was conducted in Dutch. When Martin van Buren went to church at the Reformed Church in Kinderhook, the services were in Dutch. So that Martin van Buren holds the distinction of being the the only American president so far for whom English was his second language. He only begins to speak English and learn English when he begins to go to school um, at, in, in Kinderhook. Um, it's a, I've often wondered, did, did Martin Van Buren speak with a, with a Dutch accent when he was an adult? And there's no record apparently of anybody mentioning that, but um, they've done some, there, there's at least one scholar who has done some studies on Martin Van Buren's um, writing style. Uh, his letters, his, he, he actually wrote an autobiography and uh, came to the conclusion that if you, know how to, if you know how to parse these things, you can find pretty good evidence in the, the grammatical constructions that Martin Van Buren used, even as an, uh, as an adult in retirement, um, reflected the fact that in his mind, he was thinking, when he thought of grammar, he was thinking grammar as a, a hybrid of, of English and, and Dutch together. Now, there are other people in the Hudson Valley who are not Dutch, who look at these people and are not amused with them. One of them is Washington Irving, who um, publishes his stories, many of which revolve around his Dutch neighbors that he grew up that in, around the, in the Terrytown area and stories of the Catskills. Uh, which of course is where Rip Van Winkle lives. And when you read Washington Irving's stories, be it the, the sketchbook or the Knickerbocker history of New York, what you're looking at is some pretty pointed satire at these Dutch people who Irving knew, these people that, that clung to their Dutchness despite the fact that um, the British had, by the time Irving is born, the British had been in charge of the area for over a hundred years. Uh, the illustrations that Irving has put in his books, including the one here on the right, portraying these, the, these, these Dutch people in the valley as being, as you can see, overweight, listless, dull, and miserly. Um, and uh, obviously the people who are the leaders of the Reformed Church do not agree with this um, and are, are rather put, a, put, put back at this image that's growing up of this is what it means to be Dutch. So how do you counter that? Well, they did it by um, pushing the, for the elimination of Dutch in their churches um, and adopting more American uh, worship styles. Um, 
cooperating with uh, the revival, some of the revival uh, movements that uh, characterized the United States or the colonies even before the revolution, beginning with the Great, the great Awakening in the, six, in the 1740s and then on into the Second Great Awakening, roughly 1800. Um, the Dutch, of course, have in the background, at least, much to do with the American Revolution, particularly if, with financing it. So that when the United States becomes a separate country in 1783, um, the connections, the fin particularly financial connections, that had developed because of the Dutch bank, the, the Amsterdam bankers helping to finance the American Revolution, leads them to, among other things, look to the United States as another as a place for more investment particularly since the United States is now wide open since it's no longer part of the British Empire. One of the, probably the most successful of them is the Holland Land Company, which is organized in New York in 1792. And um, in cooperation with the, uh, uh, the power, the political powers that be in New York, the Clintons especially, who have intermarried into some of the, um, uh, old Dutch families, and then also in the colony of Pennsylvania, the Holland Land Company gets control over huge swaths of land and uh, begins to sell it off to, to farmers. And uh, um, in fact, Buffalo's original name was New Amsterdam to, to kind of stamp, put, a, put a, the, the, a final stamp on what it is the Holland Land Company hopes to accomplish here. Um, thousands and thousands of acres. There will be Dutch investors who will be involved, who will become involved in financing things like the Erie Canal project in the, 17, in the 18 teens and on to 1820. Uh, later on, there will be Dutch, Dutch financiers who will become involved with um, um, financing the construction of American railroads, particularly the railroads uh, in, in the Midwest. There will be individual Dutch entrepreneurs who will decide that um, there's money to be made in the American market. One of them is a man by the name of Hermanus Plantin, who um, is kind of a, I guess today we'd probably call him a pharmacist. And um, Plantin has an idea that uh, it would be really good if given how bad medicine tasted if you could find a way for people to swallow a medicine without having to taste how bad the medicine tasted. So he comes up with a process by which you can make um, capsules that will dissolve in the human body that will contain the, in, the, the medicine and get it past your tongue and into your, in, and into your stomach. Well, Garrett Planton comes to New York, as you see here on the bottom, 1836, and he sets up a factory in New York where he manufactures his pills. Um, and uh, eventually Garrett Planton will bring his entire family over. He'll settle, settle in New York, stay there. His sons will, um, go, will be educated both in the United States and in the Netherlands. One of his sons will become the Dutch Consul General um, for, in New York for about 30 years, which means he's gonna play a major role in helping to ferry Dutch immigrants through New York when immigration resumes from the Netherlands in, in, large, in large numbers beginning in the late 1840s. Um, other other uh, people from the Netherlands with specific skills, this is the examples I'm giving here are gonna come a little bit later, but the, 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 pr the, pr the process is still the same. Um, Dutch flower growers, one of them is a guy named Loren, uh, Lambertus Bobbink, um, whose company for about 30 years will become almost a synonym for the flower business in the United States. Uh, Dutch cattle dealers, uh, particularly after the Civil War, when steam-driven ocean-going ships make transporting cattle across the Atlantic uh, a much more uh, plausible thing to do. Or... Um, Dutch produce growers or Dutch importers uh, will begin, will, will, will 
come into the United States, largely congregating in the port cities, but you'll also find them not very, by the time of the Civil War, there will be Dutch, Dutch people, um, businessmen involved in, uh, in San Francisco um, and um, in Texas. The Dutch government will have a consul in, uh, a vice consul in Galveston by, don't quote me on this, but it's roughly 1860. Um, clearly, uh, Dutch textile manufacturers looking for American cotton. Meanwhile, back in New York, in the leaders of the Reformed Church, the Reformed Church finds itself or fears that it's becoming more in less and less of a of a of a factor uh, in the in New York that. Uh, the leaders of the Reformed Church do not like Andrew Jackson. Uh, by and large, they, they find the Jacksonian way of, of doing politics uh, unnice, to be charitable about it. Um, two, two ministers are, are key, key players in this. One is Thomas DeWitt, who is the minister of the Collegiate Church in New York City. The other is Isaac Wyckoff, who is the minister of one of the Reformed churches in, in Albany. Thomas DeWitt is among other things, one of the founders of the New York, New York Historical Society, who, is, who believes that uh, the story of New Netherland deserves to have more recognition in the United States. He also believes that the United States would be a better country if they could import more immigrants from the Netherlands who would bring their thrift and their probity with them, their sobriety with them. Um, and Wyckoff, of course, um, goes along with this. So what's going to happen is DeWitt is going to use his influence as a minister in the Reformed Church to try to reestablish closer ties with the Hervormdekerk in the Netherlands. And DeWitt will actually make a trip across the Atlantic in 1846 to attend a, a general synod of, of the, of the Hervormdekerk. What he's looking for are documents dealing with the early years of New Netherland and the early years of the Reformed Church in New Netherland that he can bring back for an archive in the United States. DeWitt and Wyckoff also are personally very taken by the stories they hear from the Netherlands during the 1830s and the 1840s of the economic problems and the social problems that the Netherlands is going through because of the financial disruption, the economic disruption that comes with um, the breakup of the, uh, with uh, uh, the, the unsuccessful war to, to keep Belgium part of, the, part of the Netherlands in 1831 and the economic disruption that came with the drawing of the international border there. Um, the potato famine, which largely gets um, connected to Ireland for good reason, but the potato famine strikes much of Northwestern Europe, including the Netherlands. So there are problems with starvation, there is problems with poverty, and DeWitt feels that the Americans, the American Dutch people, the descendants of the Netherlands, should do what they can to help alleviate those problems with their fellow um, Calvinists on the other side of the ocean. So when DeWitt goes to the Netherlands in 1846, he meets with religious dissenter ministers. One in particular is Hendrik Sculte, the fellow on the right. He's also corresponding with Albertus Van Ralte, another dissenter minister who has left the state church for reasons that we don't have the time to get into. And Van Ralty's brother-in-law, Anthony Brummelkamp. And during this trip, DeWitt with Sculte and Van Ralty begin to think about how can they begin to bring poor, Ameri poor Dutch immigrants to the United States for a settlement that uh, this would increase the Dutch population in the American society. And DeWitt and Wyckoff thinks this would make America a better place. And Van Ralty is, is looking for a place to go believing that the problems that the Netherlands has are the judgment of God. The result is 
the resumption of immigration in 1846. And Vinralti himself leads the first shipload to, to arrive in New York in November of 18, 1846. A second ship comes in the beginning of November, December. A third ship comes in between Christmas and New Year's. Van Ralty and his group made it to Michigan for that winter. The, the second group made it to Albany and had to stay there. The third group never made it out of New York City for the winter because navigation shut down on the river. What we have then is this, this, this um, pattern. The people who will leave the Netherlands will come from the, the economically the most distressed areas, tend to be from the most distressed areas. Right along with that, the economically most distressed areas of the Netherlands also tend to be the areas where religious dissent is most prevalent. What this will produce is um, a, an economic imbalance or a, a numerical imbalance in who the immigrants from the Netherlands are. The religious dissenters make up less than 10% of the population, but they'll make up more than 20% of the immigrants. Um, and they are coming, they are leaving the Netherlands, among other reasons, because they want to prove that they are the, the that they religiously are correct, which means they're going to tend to stay together, organize themselves into communities that are based around congregations. Um, but also, they will have ministers who are educated people. Um, literacy will be very high among them since they're heavily Protestant, but there will also be a significant number of immigrants leaving the Netherlands already beginning in the 1840s who will be another kind of religious dissenter, which will obviously be um, the Roman Catholics who found themselves on the wrong side of the border when that line had been drawn uh, after the war uh, with Belgium in the 1830s. And almost, and instead of organizing themselves or settling themselves into one big colony in the West, which is a lot of what really Van Ralty wanted to do in Sculpting. Instead, what happens almost immediately is there, there will be scatter, a scattering of, of the new immigrants because of largely the trade patterns, or the, the transportation patterns. So there will be a number of immigrants you see right here who um, congregate in the New York area, out on Long Island. Then they follow the Hudson River. There'll be uh, Dutch speaking churches founded in the Albany area beginning roughly 1850, 1855. There will be Dutch speaking congregations that will organize along the Erie Canal route, also already in the, in the 1850s. And then there will come this where the largest number of immigrants from the Netherlands are gonna settle in, in the Midwest. The truth of the matter is that there are other Dutch immigrants who will precede them. And again, we go back to these people who often were representatives of Amsterdam banks that are looking for opportunities for investment the place to invest in the United States is on the frontier and beginning roughly with 1840, 1845, the, the, the uh, infrastructure investment in the United States, the digging of the canals, the, the, um, the, the construction of the railroads, the building of the bridges across places like the Mississippi River. Dutch bankers will provide capital. Dutch engineers will provide ex expertise. But the numbers, the big numbers, are going to be people largely rural from the Netherlands who will settle in farming communities around the Great Lakes, the biggest number, of course, being in West Michigan, um, and then in the area here in Southeast Iowa, where an, a, a colony is founded in 1847-48, 
by Hendrik Skulte. Um, in the, um, to, to, to simplify this, for the next 50, 60 years, the bulk of the Dutch immigrants uh, will, will settle in these five places. Um, they, of course, will, will spread out as their numbers increase. Um, after the Civil War, there will be a, a significant increase in the number of, of these Dutch settlements in the Great Plains. Um, in almost every single case, you will find a combination of a church, a real estate promoter, and in all likelihood, um, capital being provided either directly or indirectly from bankers in, in, um, in, in Amsterdam. So that they will organize themselves into companies that come and go, um, um, partnerships that will come and go. You'll note, you can, you'll also, when you look at this, find out that they weren't particularly bound to the United States if they could find the same opportunities in, in Canada, particularly in Manitoba and in Alberta, they would go there. So here we have the Netherlands American Land Company of Amsterdam, which has its head, head office in Canada in Winnipeg, but you'll also notice that it has an office in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, or here's a company that comes out of Chicago, Fredrickson, Frederick, Prince and Zwanenberg was a Dutch company that linked itself to a Danish operator to promote, um, in this case, a Dutch colony in Minnesota that was located 100 miles straight west of Minneapolis, St. Paul, and would be inhabited almost exclusively by people coming from um, Dutch already existing Dutch neighborhoods in Wisconsin and Illinois and, and Iowa. Um, this company on the, on the right, the, uh, the mortgage bank, they went into the rental business, bought up um, whole sections of land in central Minnesota and uh, decided that the way to make money was to rent it out um, to farmers. The Dutch settlers in the upper Midwest will follow the, very much the same pattern as um, other ethnic groups will. They much prefer to own their land so that um, things like the, the, the mortgage bank will ultimately end up selling off their a lot, most of their holdings uh, to individual holders. The immigrants will, will have a, develop a whole network of correspondence among themselves um, through newspapers, given what the technology of the day was. Some of these newspapers were directly connected to particular churches. De Wachter um, was under the control of, the, of the, the Christian Reformed Church. Others of them are owned by private in lay, laymen, um, but often will be connected to a particular uh, religious group. So the De Wachstem here from um, Wisconsin, it caters to um, a Dutch Roman Catholic population in the upper Midwest. Um, uh, the, the, these, when you look at these newspapers, they are an absolute goldmine for what the social life of these colonies were and also um, how, um, uh, how much land costs and also which colony was connected to which, to which settlement was connected with which settlement. Um, There'll be whole patterns for who, 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 the, who the news comes from. Um, also, these newspapers will circulate back in the Netherlands as well. And so they become a source of luring more immigrants over um, as, the years, as the years go by. The, um, you can see in this map here that um, where these that, that there's a very distinct pattern. This is this is this is even that is still discernible, as late as the, in this case the 2000 um, the 2000 census of where who who identified themselves as of Dutch background. And what you what you see here is the. Um, um, 
that they, they tended to stay in the North. And much of the reason why is that up until roughly 1910, when you looked at those newspapers that I, that I just showed you the, head, the, the, the headings for, and you read what the land dealers were, promote, were, were selling in these newspapers, the land dealers, by and large, will overwhelmingly tell people from the Netherlands, you don't want to go to the American South. The climate down there will literally kill you. Um, that will change after roughly 1900, when the upper Midwest becomes so thoroughly uh, settled or be, be, and or the, the arable land becomes to, begins to run out in the upper Midwest. And then all of a sudden we'll find Dutch land dealers who are going to um, happily tell people that Texas is really a nice place to be and you'll love it in the wintertime. And um, it was, it's not really so bad after all, and you're not gonna die down there. Well, the result of, the result of that was often um, pretty disastrous. Um, the switch to the South by people from with roots back to the Netherlands is going to accelerate after the Second World War and the invention of air conditioning and, and um, into, um, down into Florida. There'll be exceptions, obviously. The other thing that I wanna emphasize with when you look at this map is uh, the connection between the, that you can, you can discern often with where did these Dutch companies invest their, the, the Dutch capitalists invest their money. One of the, one, one very prominent example of this was a railroad company that became known as the Kansas City Southern, which ran from Kansas City here down to Port Arthur, Texas in the Beaumont area. It was a company that was started by an American. The American goes bankrupt, which was a pretty fr frequent thing to have happen. So to get bailed out of the bankruptcy, they bring in a new set of investors. The investors who come in come from Amsterdam and the new investors settle down in Kansas City. The railroad meant little if it didn't make money and it didn't make money if it didn't have people along the, along the tracks. And so what happened is the investors in the Kansas City Southern Railroad will decide that um, in order to, to, make mo to, to make this more profitable, they will try to start settlements along this line right here, which follows the route of, the can of, that, of that railroad company. And right down here, just um, maybe 15, 10 miles, 10 miles north of the Gulf Coast, they will start a town called Naderlund, Texas and they will bring over Dutch immigrants in the 1890s to settle in Niederland, Texas, um, specifically um, people who, who um, were truck farmers, basically, um, and uh, rice farmers. They turn them into, turn these grain farmers in, in, into, into rice farmers um, in, that, in, that, in that colony. Um, the other thing, and I, if I had a different set of slides, I could show you this. The other thing that you find remarkable is if you superimpose on this map of people's ethnic identity, if you take a map and superimpose on it, a map of where, were, where are the churches that still use the word reformed in their names, overwhelmingly, you'd find them in exactly the same location, which, which highlights, again, the connection in the, the the second wave of Dutch immigration after the 1840s, the connection between the Dutch immigrants and, um, and uh, their, their religious persuasion, which again is a reflection of how many of them were religious, had been religious dissenters um, in the Netherlands. Um, they, they will also leave behind in, in the bigger colonies, they will, they will establish um, societies um, you will the 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 even the, the ones the, the people who were of not of little or no religious persuasion, um, uh, they would you would find for instance in the Chicago area and in the West Michigan, and in the uh, the New York area, societies that these that they would they would um, 
organize. The Holland Society of New York being the sort of thing. Um, they would organize um, mutual aid societies. One, one major one tended to be um, insurance for, um, for uh, funerals. Be bowing to the inevitable. We're all going to die and everybody deserves a decent funeral. So pooling the resources to, um, to provide for people's a decent burial. Some of those burial funds will become so sizable that they will in turn be turned into um, the way in which the Dutch immigrants will, will um, fund themselves. So that for instance, in the Patterson, New Jersey area, the Holland Mutual Burial Fund will be the way people bought houses. Um, by borrowing money from the burial fund for their mortgage, the burial fund takes, takes a lien against the, the, the house. And then um, when you pay off the mortgage, you, you get your, your deed back. Um, funding the construction of churches through the burial funds uh, would be another thing that happened. The ironic thing, and this is kind of where I wanna, I'm getting near the, getting, uh, near, um, the end for, for what I wanted to say. One of the ironies is the windmills, which of course is, I have to get back to the windmills because this is what I advertised I was going to talk about. The, the windmill becoming the symbol of these Dutch um, immigrant uh, communities. And I just picked out um, seven of them here uh, for their geographical spread. So we got everything from Linden, Washington, which is in the northwest corner of Washington, just a few miles south of the, uh, of the border with uh, British Columbia, all the way to uh, Clymer, New York, which is um, about um, 50, 60 miles south of Buffalo, um, down to Nederland, Texas, uh, in, in, in the far south. Um, when you study immigration, you find out that um, the immigrants, immigrant groups like to think that they were unique and that America was, would be a better place, could be a better place if they would just be more like the immigrants were. Um, in the case of the, particularly the religious dissenters from the Netherlands and the same thing would be true if we're talking about Norway or, or Sweden or Denmark or Germany for that matter. Um, the, the religious dissenters often leave the, in the case of the Dutch, they were leaving the Netherlands because they literally believed God had abandoned the Netherlands because it was no longer religiously um, um, orthodox. So they want to prove that they are right. Well, the way over time they begin to think, maybe we can prove, maybe we can show how right we are, is by symbolizing what it is that they had left because they wanted to leave, but then putting this symbol in their new home to show, A, we've arrived, B, we're here, C, we're not going anywhere, and D, we're immensely proud of who we are. And so particularly after the Second World War, these things start to, to appear. Um, they also become very care closely connected in the bigger area, in, in some of the bigger communities, with some kind of a local festival that would suppose that would highlight their Dutchness. Uh, with clumpen dancers and street sweepers and, and, and things of, of that sort. Which brings up an interesting phenomenon that you'll that you find once in a, every every so often um, of reporters, um, scholars from the Netherlands coming to the United States to find out well what happened to all those immigrants and coming to a place like Pella, Iowa, and being and talking to the local people there about well this is what it means to be Dutch. And finding that the idea of Dutch is frozen in the past. The idea that the Netherlands has changed since they left tends to not exist very well in, in these communities. And if your symbol becomes 
clump and dancers and windmills and tulips. Um, and that becomes the symbol of the Netherlands, along with often churches that historically have roots in the Netherlands. You have the irony of they're more proud to be Dutch in the United States than they probably would have been when they, if they had remained, if they'd remained in, in the Netherlands in the first place. Um, and so here we have them, some of them, some of them more authentic than others. Some of them actually work, um, actually do um, grind grain. Um, and all of them commemorating one way or another, the Dutch, the Dutch heritage that, um, um, that, um, came to characterize um, this, these, this particular um, locale. Um, and, and, and this idea of Dutchness becomes so, so deeply rooted in, the, in some of these communities. My favorite one is the story of Fulton, Illinois, where the windmill, the, 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 the mayor of Fulton who promoted building the windmill uh, a couple of decades ago, um, he, 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 they wanted to promote, you know, make, why would people, make people wanna stay and spend some money, you know? So we build a windmill and, 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 a, and a, a museum to go with it. And the, the mayor that pushed, that pushed the idea was Polish, a Polish background. Um, so that uh, becoming Dutch isn't necessarily something, you, have, you, you don't have to be Dutch apparently to be Dutch anymore in, some, in, in, in these places. You're Dutch if you identify with the place. Um, and uh, the windmill still, um, thrives and 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 the, the both as a symbol of the Netherlands but also <laughs> the windmill still sells folks just like uh, the Hudson Fulton uh, um, celebration in in uh, 1909 it sold a lot of postcards and sold a lot of pennants and uh, souvenirs well um, you can still buy potato chips with windmills on them I don't know what that has to do with the Netherlands other than but um, they since they come from Minnesota or you can buy paint hopefully not uh, um, lead-based anymore like um, the Dutch boy was back in 1907. But um, say what you will, uh, the windmill does become one of the symbols of, of what it means to be Holland, Hollander, um, Dutch, Netherlander um, throughout the United States and uh, from one, one side of the, one end of the country to the other. Um, it's a symbol that the, the Dutch themselves embraced for defining who they are. And um, for other people who are not Dutch saying, yeah, those, those are Dutch people there, or that's a Dutch town. So with that, um, I'm right on time, Bob. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was, uh, so uh, Professor uh, Emeritus uh, Robert Schuna Youngen uh, from Calvin University, thank you so much for that presentation. You helped me get a better understanding of my Dutch heritage and growing up in that little community on the west side of Chicago. So thank you so much for that. Uh, we do have time for questions. And um, if you do have a question for, uh, for Bob, uh, go to the Q&A box, which is found on the bottom of your screen. And while we're waiting for you to write your questions, um, yes, I, I will answer one question already. Yes, this presentation was recorded and it will be made available on the uh, Netherlands America um, website. So you need to go to the and you'll be able to get a copy of this recording uh, sometime in the next day or so. And if you enjoyed today's lecture, um, let us know and um, maybe we'll be able to do some more in the future. Uh, and certainly be sure to look at the naf.org website for uh, lectures that are being held uh, not only here, but in New York and other branches of the NAF and of course are all available uh, on Zoom during this pandemic time. So um, here's a question uh, to get us started. Can you distinguish between the experience of Frisian immigrants mm -hmm. versus those from other parts? Um, yeah, I mean, with, with the, 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 the Frisians of course bring their own language with them and um, 
one of the, I, I think I can answer that by broadening it out a little bit. Um, I think we have to remember that when the immigrants came, this is true for any group of immigrants, but we'll, we'll stick with the Netherlands. Um, they come from specific villages and until well into the 19th century, the, your, your village or the area around your village was re, often where, you, where your primary sense of belonging, your primary sense of identity came from. Um, so that um, part of what happens with the immigration experience is that people from the various provinces of the Netherlands who find themselves living side by side now in Chicago or Patterson or Orange City or you know wherever um, are being acquainted with each other for the first time. So a Frisian becomes acquainted with a Gelderlander um, and um, they all come with their um, pride of, of, of place that they brought with them. Um, and uh, sometimes they handle it well and sometimes they don't. They have fights with each other and um, the, free, the Frisian language hangs on. But in the end, what, ha what tends to happen is that whether they're Frisian or Groninger or Zeelander or whatever, or they identify with their village, you know, they're, they're outdoorpers, um, they over time begin to see themselves more as Dutch than as, or some fusion of Frisian and Dutch. That's the simplest way to put it. Although there will be Frisian societies. I have to say this, there, there will be Frisian societies in, in all the major uh, Dutch settlements where they will hang on to the language and they'll have uh, here in Grand Rapids up until within the last 10 years, I think, you used to be able to find once in a while, a place where you could go on a Sunday and uh, sing f hymns in Frisian. Okay, next question, Bob. How and when did California, Washington, and Oregon become so Dutch? Um, the simplest, uh, the, it's chronologically, it begins in the Northwest. Um, the 1890s, um, it's going to be... Um, people from existing Dutch settlements in initially it'll be people from existing Dutch settlements in the Midwest who are looking for cheaper farmland because farmland in Iowa and Nebraska is becoming too expensive. So going to the Northwest was seen as another opportunity to buy, to buy um, cheaper land. One of the things to understand um, when, when, especially among the rural settlers, this is a generational thing. These are fathers trying to set up sons. So you buy enough land so that you can subdivide the land so that when the sons grow up, they can have a farm and then the father can retire to town, right? So the price of land is, is, is a crucial factor in here. Um, the 1892, 93 is gonna be the Northwest also being promoted by the Northern Pacific Railroad Company. California is going to be Southern California will be roughly 1910-1911. Okay, next question is about Catholic uh, immigrants. Uh, their departure seemed to be more about economic conditions than religious. And did they do the same thing as the Protestants and were they led by religious leaders? I'll start with the last question. The answer is yes. Um, there were um, a, num a pretty significant number of um, priests trained either in the Netherlands or in Belgium, who, um, so there'd be Flemings uh, who, were, who, who were leaders. Um, the first Dutch Catholic settlement is Little Shoot in Wisconsin up by Green Bay in 1848. And it is founded by a Dutch Catholic missionary who had been sent there to, as, a, as a missionary to the Native Americans. And um, he brought the cat. He he brought a group of Catholics over to work as um, pick and shovel people on a canal they were digging to uh, connect um, Green Bay to um, the Mississippi River. Uh, there will so that there will be a significant number of Catholic priests, particularly the Crozier Fathers, 
will be one of the orders, the Catholic orders that will provide um, priests for Dutch Catholics. And you will find um, Dutch Catholic uh, parishes in uh, New Jersey, Chicago, Grand Rapids had Dutch Catholic parish um, led by a priest who came from the Netherlands or priests from the Netherlands. And I think you, uh, you've talked in the past, there is a uh, windmill in Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah, the fact, if I went back to my, if I go back to the slide here, uh, if I went to the first, back to the very beginning here, I hate to do this to people because it's like getting a migraine. Uh, the one up in the, let me get you out of the way, Bob. The one in the upper left, that's uh, Little Shoot, Wisconsin. Which is Catholic. Right? Which is Catholic, Catholic. Yeah. to pair. Uh, so this is an interesting question. What town in the U.S. would you recommend to visit <laughs> if you wanted to get a typical impression of Dutch heritage, history, and culture? You probably get a lot <laughs> of argument about that one. <laughs> You know, I got relatives in some of these places, and I have to stay on speaking terms with them. Um, um, well, I'm going to just say it. I think the one that's probably, of the ones I've actually been to, and I've been to a lot of them, I'd have to say Pella, Iowa. How come? Um... <laughs> Because of the way they, the, the, the local Chamber of Commerce has imposed their notion of Dutchness on the architecture of downtown. Orange City, Iowa got a, is a, has a, a similar set of uh, um, building restrictions. Uh, they, can, they, can even make, they can even bring in Pizza Hut and make them look like a Dutch house. <laughs> right? um, so it, it, but it's, um, you know, it, it's going to be Dutch in the same sense that going to Madura Dam is going to Holland, you know. For those, you know, it's it, it's. Um, I'll leave it at that before I get into any more trouble. Okay, so this next one, um, uh, it, it seems like once a year or so, the New York Times or some other national publication will do a story um, on, um, let's say, Northwest Iowa. Uh, Horn City, and part of us want to roll our eyes and say <laughs> there are so many cliches, but at the same time, there's a something admirable about, about it. So, what uh, is it that gives these Dutch communities like Linden and Orange City and Holland their durability, their identifiable and cohesive Dutchness? Um, one is the very conscious effort to do so. Two, um, there's economics behind this. There, there, you know, for, for, for every Orange City and for every Pella that is still there and is conscientiously thinking of themselves as Dutch, there, we can start naming dozens and dozens of places where they have lost that to a large degree, they've lost that identity or it's been erased. All the failed colonies. Um, um, but um, in, in the case of Northwest Iowa, economics is a huge piece of it. Uh, the, 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 the base of it's an agricultural base and uh, it is still, it still thrives. So you have to have, you have to be able to keep, attract and keep young people one generation after another. Um, and um, economics is, is, is a part of it. So that you can go into, into uh, Dutch, Dutch communities in let's say rural Minnesota, rural South Dakota, who have watched the populations draining because of the, the economics just aren't there anymore to, to, to sustain it. I lived in Southwest Minnesota for 28 years. And when I moved there in 1975, there were still uh, about two farms per section of land per square mile. By the time we left, there was less than one per square mile average. Uh, you, just, you just do the math and you can figure some, the people had to leave. They, they went somewhere. All right, next question. Did the landscape where Dutch immigrants settled have anything to do with why they went there? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, they are not afraid of flat. They are not afraid of mud. Um, and they are not afraid of cloudy weather. <laughs> do, do I have to say any more? <laughs> no, so, no, I mean, you can find there, there, there's some very fascinating ones. They tend to be smaller ones that don't get talked about a whole lot. But the, the muck farming communities, Celeryville, Ohio, uh, Comstock, Michigan, uh, Hollandale, Minnesota, South Holland, Illinois, South Holland, Illinois. There are muck, there, these were the muck where the muck farmers went. H Hudsonville, Michigan. Um, and th there, there's a very specific example of these folks knew how to drain land and grow produce on it. Do we know whether any of the immigrants or how many of the immigrants returned to the Netherlands, just got turned off by the, what they found here? Um, that's a hard number to come by. Um, there are, they, they, they do exist. One of the problems that I, the areas that I concentrate on are Minnesota and, and New Jersey. And one of the things that I have found in, in both, but especially in New Jersey, where you know it was only 15 miles to get to the Holland America Line docks. Um, the people who came tended to throw all the money they had at getting to the United States to the point where they had no reserve to go back, even if they wanted to. And a number of them did want to, would love to have gone back. I mean, they find out that working in a textile mill in Patterson is not fun. Um, but you can't go back. The other thing I think you have to remember with human beings is when they left, they thought, yeah, man, I'm going to make it. How do you go back and eat that much crow? <laughs> if you find out, no, you, you, it, it isn't what you thought it was going to be. Um, and then just getting back and forth, um, getting back and forth is a huge problem. Um, I'm, I'm reading old newspapers from roughly 1910, 1920. People will, will go back to the Netherlands for vacations. These are people who can afford to do this. Going to the Netherlands to visit the relatives in 1910 meant you took three months. So if you're, if you're a, a, just a, a manual laborer, you, do not have, you can't afford to take three months to go home to see the relatives. Um, so the, again, economics becomes a big problem, a big reason why a number, a number of them don't go back. So just to follow up on that a little bit, mm -hmm. I, I do know of an example of my grandfather's family visiting the Netherlands in the 20s, and they also donated um, after World War II to their cousins. Mm -hmm. but in general, um, once there was a telephone and telegraph, yep. another was there much more communication and collaboration yep. between? Different yeah, different especially after especially after the Second World War. Um, the Second World War changes so many things. Uh, getting back and forth across the Atlantic becomes easier, especially when you have transatlantic airplanes. So like uh, the Dutch Immigrant Society uh, here in Michigan, one of the reasons that it, it, it comes into existence is to, um, so they could pool, they could, they could pool their money and, and um, lease or uh, rent a plane to take a whole plane load across for, for less than you'd pay if you, you all went individually. So they'd have summer, summer excursions back to, back to the Netherlands. How many Americans consider themselves of Dutch ancestry? What do you think this will, will show? You know, I used to have a number at the top of my head. Um, it is about two to three million, I think it is. Don't quote me on that. But it's in, it's in that neighborhood. And, and that's... Uh, <laughs> that's a that's an interesting one you know when when um what do you do with last names that changed um are there are, there, are you still dutch when your last name is hamilton hmm. when it used to be hamedaman <laughs> you know um uh, are you are you still dutch when your last name is hartley and it used to be then hartog um it, 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 back to back to I think this is self identity. These are these are people who, on the census, said this is who I say I am. 
So it's, it's, it's self-selection. Because then you had the people who didn't want to be Dutch anymore, and they, they would, did everything to walk away from it. So this is from a correspondent who says, the Dutch government paid my one-way fare to the U.S. <laughs> in 1963 with a provision I would stay for a minimum of two years. Yeah. Otherwise, I'd have to pay to get back myself. Yeah. Um, all this to encourage immigration. Do they still have programs like this? I don't think so. Um, the, the, the Dutch government was confronted with a very dire set of circumstances right at the end of the Second World War. And then right in the aftermath of the war, the, um, the war that the Netherlands fought to try to keep the East Indies as a colony, which of course they failed. And the influx of refugees from what became Indonesia into the Netherlands, plus the fact that for 20, 30 years, there had been very little ability to build housing and whatnot in the Netherlands. And then just the, the ransacking that they had from the Germans during the occupation. So that um, um, the Dutch government solution was to literally pay people to leave, either to the United States, Canada, or Australia, become the, become the big magnets. Um, that, but I, at this point, I don't think they do that anymore. Okay, we've got time for two last questions here. Um, the first is, uh, what would you advise for a Dutch citizen who is in the U.S. and wants to visit Dutch communities? Where would you take them on a tour? Um, that's a good one. Um, I would say Holland, Michigan. And Pella, Iowa, Orange City, Iowa. Um, Lyndon, Washington, um, and given the space of the, given the distances of the United States, that's probably a vacation or plus two or two or three right there. Okay. Last question. Uh, which book would you recommend as the best book describing the history of the Dutch in the United States? This is by Hans Krabendam, who is a scholar in the Netherlands. And um, it's called Freedom on the Horizon. It's, it's, a, it's a good read. And um, let me see. There's, so this, this, is, this, is, this is a good one. And um, I'm trying to think if I got another one here somewhere. There's a couple of doorstops that came out about um, 30, 40 years ago, but uh, they're like reading encyclopedias. Um, um, <laughs> this is one of them. This was, this, this was published in the 1920s. Um, and there's another one, it's called, I don't have a copy here with me. It's called, oh, there it is. Here's the other one. This is, this is where you're going to get the maps and the statistics. Bob Swearinga, Robert Swearinga, who taught for years at Kent State um, and is still putting out um, very lengthy books on Dutch history. And this is Faith and Family, Dutch Immigration and Settlement in the United States, 1820, 1920. Um, and um, those are the two best ones. The two, the two okay. most accessible ones, put it that way. Right. Well, and then, there, and then I would also suggest, um, I got to make a plug here for Calvin University Heritage Hall. Um, if you go to Calvin University's website, plug in Heritage Hall, um, one of the things you will find as you rummage through the site will be um, the back issues of a publication called Origins that Calvin University's Heritage Hall has been producing since like 1985, um, twice a year. And you'll find a lot of good short stories in there about um, um, all kinds of things about Dutch immigration. And I think you told me you have some articles being published in the next issue, is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I have one about the first Dutch American congressman from, actually he's the first new Dutch immigrant to become a member of the U.S. House of Representatives. His name is Dow Drucker. 
from Passaic, New Jersey. And um, his encounter with the, um, oh, David just put up there the origins uh, <laughs> you, you, uh, URL for you there, folks. So there it is. Um, but uh, Dow Drucker um, went, was a member of Congress from 1914 through 1919 from Passaic, New Jersey. Okay, great. So that will be an origins in the yeah. next issue. Yep. Uh, so on behalf of all of us here at the, the Netherland America Foundation and for all those watching today, we want to say thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Robert Schooner Youngen, uh, Professor Emeritus at Calvin University. Thank you for your time. Again, just a reminder to everybody watching, uh, you can see a recording of this program on our website, thenaf.org. And I hope you'll uh, keep in touch with us as we... Um, host other uh, interesting lectures on culture and, and, his, and history. Thank you so much for your time today and um, all best wishes. Have a good day, everybody.